So I am really glad to have John with us tonight. This actually kicked off a couple, three months ago when Eric Blomquist did a presentation on using classes to filter and sort in forms. And out of that grew further discussion and a contact with John. And it turns out that he has done a lot more work with classes. And so we finally were able to get get him on the schedule to join us tonight. I will give a quick introduction. John is a, a, a longtime experienced Access developer, and I'll let him provide more detail on his background and interests and where he's going from here. Questions. John is is prefers to have questions as they come up, and he will have planned places in the presentation to stop and, and entertain questions. So uh, you can either hold them to the end or wait for a pause. And with that, I will turn the time over to John, and away we go. Thank you. All right. Well, my name is John. I'm going to do a quick background. I graduated from high school in 72, joined the Navy, was trained to fix computers. In 72, I had never even seen a computer. I didn't, other than a dumb terminal in a bank. Uh, so I learned to fix computers, got out of the Navy six years later in 78, and did field engineering, flew it flying around the country, fixing uh, graphic systems, as it turns out. And about the mid 80s, I, I was an, a technician. I never got a degree. I'm completely uneducated. I like to say I'm completely uneducated. But anyway, I, I came to realize that by 85, I was making as much money as I was ever going to make as a technician. And if I wanted to make to, to advance any further, I needed to do something else. So I decided to become an in, to become a programmer. Back in those days, there were so many programmer jobs that they would take anybody. If you could fog a mirror, they'd take you as a programmer. So, um, so I was I self-taught. I learned Turbo Pascal, Turbo C. Those are Borland languages from the 80s. <clears throat> And and I actually used those in work environments. I was eventually hired as a software engineer because, well, they needed programmers so bad they would hire me as a software engineer, even though I had no engineering degree. Eventually, I went to work for Stack Electronics, makers of Stacker Data Compression, as their test department. And that's where I ran into Microsoft Access. I needed a way to log and track the bugs in the software, and there were a bunch of them. So in like 92, I discovered Microsoft Access, I think it was 1.0 probably. I was a programmer by that point. I'd spent five or six or seven years living, uh, earning a living as a programmer and then I slid into Access, and it was disconcerting. I'd never done event-driven anything. And, you know, in those days, you would write a menu, and the, you know, the user of the program would select a menu item, and your code would run. And it took me a little while to wrap my head around, well, what happens? How, how can a user just interrupt my program. It's supposed to be flowing and they click on something or they hit a key and, and what's going to happen to my program when all that happens. So it took me a little while to, to wrap my head around that. But anyway, from then until about 86, I guess, I just worked as a, 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 an, database programmer using access and eventually moved down to Mexico for five years. And I started using access. I, I built a program in, in Mexico to call vending machines, bill paying machines over a cellular phone and download data from people that had paid their bills on these machines. They, this company had built this machine to do this and got ready to put it into production and realized they didn't know how to get the data out of the machine. So they hired me and I moved down to Mexico, lived down there for five years. And I found 
Access D, which is an email group. Uh, some of you may have heard of it or be familiar with it, but Access D back in the mid 90s was a group of about 450 access programmers all over the world that would put a question to the email group and it would just be broadcast out to everybody. And then if anybody had an answer, they'd answer up and the answer would come back to everybody. And so I did I did databases for small companies from 1992 until about 2010. In the late 90s and early 2000, 2001, 2002, I had run into this thing called framework. And a framework was just a, a kind of a living, breathing thing that, that would run a database. So I, I ran into this framework concept and I said, oh, that's cool. I want to do that for my applications because I was doing libraries, as we all do. We we write code, we put modules out in a library, then we reference that library from our database, and then we call functions in modules out in the, in the library. And I did that for a while. <clears throat> but in the late 90s, I ran into class and object-oriented programming and C and stuff like that. So I got into classes and a friend of mine, Shamil Salakidnov, I think was his name. I could never pronounce his last name, but he lived in St. Petersburg. He's Russian. He was into classes and syncing events in classes. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, I had run into classes, and classes, object-oriented stuff is really, really, really cool for organizing objects out in the real world. All your code, all your data about an object. And, and Shamil tried to teach me how to do the event part of access classes. And back in 1999... 1998, 99, 2000, access wasn't very stable with that stuff. You do something wrong. If you didn't clean up behind yourself, it would just crash access. It would just close. And he got uh, discouraged with it and left. I mean, he, he went on to other things. But about that time, I finally wrapped my head around what he was doing and started using classes. And Microsoft got the bugs fixed. And so it stopped crashing. So, so that's my background. By the, by the year 2004, I got a job for disability insurance specialists up in Connecticut writing a call center for them from scratch and spent five years doing that and started with about 20 tables that I had to normalize out of a spreadsheet and by the end of five years, I had 180 tables. Uh, you know, it turned into quite a project. But in the process of doing that, I wrote my framework. Uh, just as I needed something, I'd design classes. I'd get them to sync events, do all this stuff that I'd learned how to do, and put it all out in a library, figured out how to reference these classes, uh, which is which is something that you have to figure out. You can't just reference a class out in a library without doing specific things to it to expose it outside the library. Mm. So anyway, I learned that stuff. So I designed a framework. And then, and then I got out of access entirely, ended up in C-sharp automating SQL Server because I got a big client that needed me to do that. And, and so I just got out of access entirely. But in the meantime, I'd done all this stuff. So let me minimize this just to get stuff out of the way. <clears throat> so I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to actually read, uh, because I wrote this specifically for this 
thing, this thing we're doing tonight. And so, I, and I wanted to touch on specific things. So the first thing that I wanted to touch on is object-oriented programming, which is simply a, paragra- a paradigm that allows us programmers to model real world objects and to create classes that are templates or blueprints of the objects that we want to create. Classes contain code as well as properties or variables to store data required to define or create the modeled object. I look at classes very much as I look at tables. As you know, if we normalize data correctly, every every table models something out in the world. If it might be a car or it might be a door to a car or it might be the handle on the door to a car, but one way or the other, a table models something. It stores all the data about something. What it doesn't do, of course, is store the, the code for it. So a class allows us to model an object. Um, it gives us a place to put all the code and all the data for something. <clears throat> In Microsoft Office applications, everything you see, touch, or interact with are objects. In Access, objects are things such as databases, tables, record sets, queries, forms, records on, f- controls on forms, etc. Every one of these things starts life as a class back inside of Access, which defines the object. A form is a class first, but once instantiated, which means create an instance of, displays itself as a form on the screen. A combo is a class which once instantiated displays itself on the form. And I meant to do this, by the way, I never did get a show of hands. Can I get a show of hands of how many people have actually used classes, built classes themselves? I've got two hands that I can see. Three, okay. Okay, so. I know, but I just couldn't find the button to put my hand up. Okay, I, I hear you. I'm I'm not a Zoom kind of guy, so I have this problem as well. So, of the people that have used have designed their own classes and used them, how many of you have sunk events for something inside of your classes and raised events inside your classes? Can you ask that again, John? I didn't catch the beginning of the question. Of the people that have have designed classes, that use classes, I'm going to say have used classes daily, um, how many of you have taken an object which raises events and sunk those events inside of your own class and or raised events from inside of your own class? Okay, so I'm I'm seeing two hands there. So <clears throat> I'm I'm trying to get a a feel for am I preaching to the choir or are at least some of you new to the choir? Okay, um, so um, John, yeah. I've been pretty much using this for a few years now, but I still can't figure out how to put my hand up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well that's okay. So um, yeah, I might be the choir, but I'm here to sing in harmony. Okay. Well, good. So even if you've been doing this, one final question, I guess, that I might as well ask is how many of you wrap objects from that Microsoft Access gives to us, like uh, uses a class to wrap a combo box or wrap a form or something of that nature? Okay, so it seems like there's a couple of people that do this on a regular basis. And I, I'm not seeing everybody, unfortunately, so I can't really see whether some of, uh, people off the screen are raising their hand and I can't see them. Uh, I, only can, <clears throat> okay, I, only, so, I only count two. Okay. John, can so I... So the su- bottom... Sorry yes, to interrupt, but can I suggest that you treat the those of us who have experience as here to hear what you've got to say regardless. So don't right. assume that you, you don't cover things because just two of us have seen it before. You know, right. we're here 
watch we're, we're here to to get you explain it from the basics up as everyone else is okay and i will do that so again and access objects are things such as databases tables record sets queries forms controls on forms you name it if it's in access it's a class Ex with the sole exception of the simplest variable and I suspect that behind the scenes, even those things are classes that at the, you know, the people that are programming VBA, all, everything is a class, including the simple uh, variables. But one way or the other, all these things are cl are classes out in the VBA language. <clears throat> and when. So we're accustomed to using classes. Every one of us knows how to drag and drop a uh, control on a form, a combo box on a form. And basically, when we do that, access behind the scenes is saying, oh, I've got this class called a combo box, and I'm going to draw it on the screen. And that's a class. The form is a class. The combo box is a class. And then... Um, so all of us know how to use classes. We just may or may not know that that's what we're doing. Um, so uh, the next thing I wanted to cover was the set keyword. Um, we use the set keyword to tell the interpreter we're dealing with a class or an instance of a class, i.e. an object. Uh, the set keyword in Access is doing one of two things. The first thing it can do is create a new instance of an object known as instantiation. Anybody who doesn't understand these terms and wants to just speak up and ask a question, please go ahead and do so. But um, so an example would be in VBA, dim control text color as class control text box. And so, and then set class control text color we're setting we're dimming a class as a as a class name and then we set class text control color equals new class control text box and that new keyword instantiates the class creates a an instance of that class <clears throat> and then at that point that class becomes a real object in your program. Up to that point, the class is uh, this nebulous module back behind the scenes that has a bunch of stuff in it. And when you instantiate it, it's real. And you can start using it. You can start calling functions in it, setting variables in it, and so forth. <clears throat> so that's the first thing that you can do is set an object equal to a new class and it instantiates that class. The other way that you can use the set keyword is to, to set a pointer to an instance of an object that's already that already exists. And if you can see my screen, that's what I'm doing here. I'm dimming class control text color two as class control box. And then I set color two equals um, an already existing instance. So one way instantiates it, the other says, hey, it, it already exists. Let me grab a pointer to it. So that's the two functions of the set keyword. And if you're going to use classes, and we do, you, you set record sets. I mean, if people have used a record set, or a query, you, you use the set keyword all the time. We're, we're pretty familiar with that. So for now, just understand that all of, of Access applications are our object-oriented programming. You've got VBA for uh, um, Word, you've got VBA for Excel, et cetera. All those things are object-oriented programs and Access is just a dialect of VBA, and it is object-oriented. Behind the scenes, everything is an object. So um, 
So we're given the ability to create our own classes, and that's what we're talking about tonight, and thus our own objects. So I can create a class that um, is a logger, as an example. It logs something to a text file or to a table. I can create a class that, you know, that, that um, models a, a car or something. So one thing that you're going to find out is that programming, I call them programming snobs, tell us VBA isn't a true object-oriented programming language because it doesn't have inheritance. And that's true. We can't inherit an existing object. We can't inherit any, period. Um, and if you're familiar with object-oriented languages, C++, as an example, um, yeah, you, you can just grab anything, including stuff from a library, and um, and inherit it and add new stuff to it after you inherit it. We can't do that. But what we can do is we can create a class and wrap any object that that uh, is back inside of access inside of our class, and we can expand what that thing does to do what we want it to do. And I'll give a real quick example of this. I have a record selector combo box. And it's something that I just figured out and wanted to do. And I put a, uh, this record selector up at the top of a form where I want to be able to select something in the record selector and cause the form to move to that record, right? So um, the combo box object does not have that um, ability, that functionality built into it. But I build a class and I call it class rec cell for record selector. And I pass in a combo box and I store the pointer to that combo box up in the header of my class. And I say with events and now inside of my class, I can sync the events from the combo box. And sure enough, I'll sync after update or one of the one of the events. And then I'll go find that record and cause the form to move to that record. And I've just made a combo box do something that I wanted to do that it didn't wasn't able before. So it's not inheritance, but <clears throat> but it we are we do have the ability to add new functionality to existing objects out in the world. So the snobs will tell us, yeah, it's not an object-oriented language, and it's not fully object-oriented. You can't inherit stuff. But I say. A, the world is full of snobs, and B, who cares? It, we, it's still a tool that we have that'll, that'll allow us to do things. So does anybody have any questions at this point? Um, yeah. When you're instantiating the, um, the class, um, you could do dim um, instance name as new CLS control yep. text box. Yeah. Um, and it, it doesn't seem to instantiate at that time, it's when you then use that instance that it seems to fire the class initiate. So what exactly is the difference between doing it that way and the way you've done it here? <laughs> well, that's a good question. And the answer is that when you do it, dim something as new something, Access literally behind the scenes has to check every single time you reference that thing that you set as new. Every time you reference it, it has to go do a, does this thing exist yet? And if it doesn't, make it exist. You're correct. You're absolutely correct that it doesn't instantiate it at the instance that you say the new, but the first time you use it, it does instantiate it. And every time after that, it has to go back and see, hey, is this thing existing? Which causes overhead in your program. So even worse, apparently, it can shuffle it off to, 
to the disc and stuff where it can take four seconds or five seconds for it to do that test. And in the meantime, you're trying, you're doing something time critical and it slows that down a lot. Um, And I ran into this just the other day. So John, are you you saying then that if, for example, you're iterating the controls on a form and to then bind each control to a control wrapper that rather than saying using the new keyword in that loop where you're you're iterating through you know and and instancing any number of, of, of control wrappers you should not use the new keyword that that would optimize performance if if you can see my uh my screen you've got dim as something and then set that something equals new okay that's i'm going to call it the correct way to do this you can do this dim um class as and insert the new right here and that's what we've been talking about if you um if you dim it as a new you don't have to use two lines of code essentially you know if you you do the whole instantiation right here, whereas normally we're trained to do it as uh, dim it as, and then go back on, on a second line of code, set equals, uh, actually set equals new like this. So you use two lines of code. When you do that, that whole thing of, well, it has to go out and check, does this thing even exist? goes away it doesn't have to do that anymore so you're, okay you're saying that if you use the new keyword in the set statement it does not go back and reiterate but if you use it in the declaration it does i'm saying if you use it in the set statement set something equals new class then every time thereafter that it tries to reference that something it has to literally behind the scenes do a does this thing exist? Oh, okay. So if, every if, single time. So it's it's whereas the new, it's the new keyword in the set statement that that, that, that that's pretty, correct. Okay. It's problematic. It works, but it can cause performance problems, especially if you're in a tight loop and and you're you're trying to reference something or or let's say you've got you've dimensions uh, a record set. You know how well you'll do record set dots thing and you'll do with. Well, guess what it's having to do? It's having to go, hey, does this thing even exist? Hey, does this thing even, hey, you know, over and over and over again. So you, I just don't ever do that. I don't ever use the set equals new. I learned to not do that. Okay. I do a dim statement, and then I do a set statement, and then I'm done. And from that point on, I can I can use my objects. But you, you do use a new a new keyword in, in, in the declaration. You right? have to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's not the new, it's not the new and the, you know, when you set, you have to do that. It's, it's when you try and make it all one line that it causes your problem. Okay. Very well explained. Glad I asked the question. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go here. Maybe I have an application that I wrote that that I was going to use to demo a class and I have it up on my screen I'm again I'm not a zoom okay. kind of guy well I just did that now are you seeing the zoom and uh, we want database Caesar, we're seeing your database now we are yep <clears throat> you're good now okay well good so then are you seeing something called location of a database with a whole bunch of controls on it now? I'm hearing yes, silence. We're good. So I'm we're good. Guessing... We're good. I, I'm 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 trying. I'm coughing, so I'm keeping myself muted. But yeah, we're seeing your your screen. Okay, so this is an example of a class that I created. As you guys know, 
we learned to uh, create our our uh, um, control um, events straight back in the form, and that works. But I don't like doing that, particularly when I've got this form, right? And this is a data entry form. And I got a bunch of data from my company, 10,000 records of places that I have to deliver uh, truckloads of stuff to. So I wanted to, to be able to take all of this part, the ad, the up, down, the route, all that stuff, and create a functionality, model a system of controls. So basically, I wanted to be able to move my stops that I'm driving up and down and so forth. And I wanted to be able to uh, map this thing. So once I'm done, I want to do a Google map. Now you're going to tell me, did Google map pop up? Are you seeing edge with the Google map? Yeah, yeah, yes, we are. Okay. So this is a route that I drove today. OK, that's why I was late to this meeting. So my my um, desire was to create a database, be able to enter for enter data in it, make corrections if it's not always right, which it isn't always right. And then I wanted to be able to take all of these controls over here, which are a system. They have nothing whatsoever to do with the form itself. So I can select something up here. This is my record selector, by the way, that I was telling you guys about, right? I can I can select uh, stop number 1007. And when I do that, it moves me to that record. And so I've got a, a, a class that I wrap this control in, and it's a record selector class. And so when I select something, it moves me to that record. Well, now I can take that and say, hey, add that to my route. And boom, star leasing gets added as a, as, and this is nothing more than a list control, right? So I've got a class that I pass in an add button, an up and a down button, a route button, a remove button, all this crap, all this crap, and this thing. And I throw all that stuff out into a class and it is a self-contained widget with all the code inside of it and all the variables and all the events and all the everything is out in that class. And if we go def 11, um, def 11, there we go. So I've got a class out here. You can see, I got a bunch of classes, but I've got a class that has all of that stuff. And so um, that's the way I roll. That's the way I program. I'm not going to take all of that, all of those events and put them into this form, mostly because, as I like to say, you end up with code that if you were to print it, rolls right out the door and down the street, all this stuff in one in the forms class. So anyway. So let's go back to the lecture here. So what I wanted to do was to, to create a class. Every form or report can have a class behind it, specifically there to hold your code. It will not have a class by default. A form, I don't know if, you're, if you know this or not, but a, a form is lightweight. It doesn't have a class behind it until a property is set, the has module property determines whether the form or report has a class behind it. And for a new form, it will be false. If you just throw up a form, that property is false. There's no class behind that form. You can set it to true and eh, it's still not there until you actually go do something double click and hit the ellipse in the property for some event and boom, that class is created and access editor will start dropping event syncs into the form for you. Um, so 
let me see. So by the way, if you set that prop property false and save the form and you have a bunch of code in that in the class behind the form, all your work will be gone. So you don't want to do that. Um, OK, so another way to create the class behind the form is to simply double click any of the event properties uh, in the form itself or in, in any of the objects on the form. So let me pull up my thing. I'm going to pull up something here. Uh, demo checkboxes. So get this thing out of the way. So we, we all know what this is, right? Um, you've got events for something. In this case, it's the form itself. But if I click on one of these, you've got all the events for a checkbox and so forth. So I'm going to show you this is an actual live thing that I developed for that uh, disability insurance specialist company. I actually designed this thing for them. And I'll show you an, an example of a set of rules where So a disability insurance claim can be an illness or it can be an accident. It can be workers' compensation. It can be auto-related or it can be maternity. But there are things that just obviously don't make any sense, like maternity. I should go in. Maternity is considered an illness. It's not considered an accident. Now, you and I both know maternity might be an accident, but for disability insurance claims, it can't be an accident. Auto-related is an accident. It's not an illness. So I wanted a, a, a state machine, if you will, behind the scenes, where if you click these things, a set of rules will run. And so I did that. Now, if I go into, I go into my code... and I go into one of these things, it'll take me behind the scenes. As you can see, I've got, this is the form itself. There's nothing about checkboxes in here. There's no event handlers for checkboxes in here. So I've got class modules, and one of these things is, this is it right here. This is all the code, all the variables, all the with events um, for the checkboxes and so forth. All of this stuff is about implementing those rules. Now that I have this class, I can, I can put it in this form or I can put it in any form. And as long as I have these checkboxes named the right things, and I can I can pass in all the stuff that I need to, and and all of this stuff can be on any form out there, which in a case like this doesn't make a lot of sense. But when you think about my record selector, I had a record selector on pretty much every form that they were entering data on, you know. So I had a record selector class, and it would just be implemented by my form. So. I'm coming to the realization that that the subject is is a little more complicated than, than I might be able to get through. So, so as we know, event syncs can be created right in the form class. You can just double click one of those properties, and the editor will create the event sync for you. So, why do we build a class? Why not just use the form class? And the short answer is that doing anything in a form class requires the form to be open in order to use the code. So there's that. Also, that class can't be opened multiple times because any form can only be opened once. Or so I assume. Somebody told me it, they can be opened more than once, but I don't know how that's done. So with a class, you can have the class 
instantiated in one form or a hundred forms. Secondly, a group of controls on a form may have a ton of code that isn't central to the form itself, as in that checkbox thingy, you know. Um, that functionality has has nothing to do with the form. It's it's a system. A class may represent a system that doesn't need a form to do its job at all. So a log class is an example. I can I can and do create a log class and anything anywhere in my application can just call a function and log something. And it's calling a function in a class I've instantiated and that class knows how to log something into a table or log something into a into a um into a file. So there's there are things that where you just don't even need a form to do that. A class may represent functionality that is nice to have in many different places. I have a timer class as an example. And the timer class allows me to set up multiple instances right inside of a form. I started doing this when I wanted to, how long does it take a form to open and how long does it take it to close? Uh, if you've got a whole bunch of records and you've got a bunch of subforms and they've got records, it can take a long, well, it used to be take back in the days when computers were slow. It can take a long darn time for that form to open. So I wanted to be able to time how long does it take for this to happen? How long does it take for this to happen? And so I've got a timer class that I can put in any place in my code, I can put it in a function and time, have one for an outer loop and one for an inner loop, et cetera, et cetera. So I can have a whole bunch of classes um, that just get used wherever I need to use them. And another thing that I do, and, and I do this a lot, a class might raise an event to pass messages around. This is really, really useful. I think of events as like I think of a radio station. A, a person gets on a radio station and he's broadcasting music. He doesn't have a clue who's listening, right? An event, an object that raises an event doesn't know or care who's listening to that event. A mouse click, as an example, you click the mouse in a form, the mouse click happens. Who's listening to the mouse click? Don't know. Don't care. If they're listening to it and they have a use for it, that's fine. If nobody's listening to it, that's fine. So so that's I, I have a message class that you can call a function of that message class, and it's got a from to subject and message, those four things, just like a, an email. So you can call a function and pass those four things off to it. Who's calling this? Who's this from? Who's it to? What's the subject? And, and so forth. And that class then raises an event. It raises a message event that says, hey, somebody wanted to send out a message. And the from is who it was that wanted to send the message. The two is, hey, who's supposed to be listening for this thing? And then the subject and the and the text are specific to those people. And so I so a message class can be called from any place in any form, any event, any place you want to. You can just call a message class and say, hey, send a message for me. And the message class goes, okay. And it raises the event and up pops this thing and out goes and out goes a message. If nobody's listening for it, that's OK. If somebody is listening for it, all of a sudden over there in that form over there, uh, they go, oh, there's a message coming in and it's for me. And I'm supposed to look at the subject and I go, hmm, OK, I know what I'm supposed to do with this. And they process the message. So you can you can transfer control of stuff around your application using messages. And I will show an example of that. I've got a 
I've got an example of that here. Uh, let me get this thing up where I can see it. Okay. So this is an example of exactly that. I'm sending a message. And that message is, this thing calls this message class and says, hey, send a message for me. And this goes, hey, I'm listening to that. And so I'm going to display the message. And it says, hey, form one sent a message that says hi there. And now I can send a message back. Hi, how you doing? So this form sent a message. Hi, how you doing? And this form got the message and said, hey, form message two said umpty -um. Now, these things aren't. I mean, that's a, a silly example, but when you start thinking about logs now, if an error happens, I can, the error handler can send a message through this message class that said, hey, an event hap uh, um, an error happened, and the logger class can sync those messages and can go, oh, an error happened. Let's write an error log, right? So this is just an example of two different classes, a message class and a logger class. And any code anywhere in my, in my program can say, raise a message. The two is going to be the logger class and the message is the subject and so forth. And the, the logger class goes, oh, my goodness, a, somebody sent a message to the logger class. That's me. And I'm going to log whatever the subject was and what and the time and the date and all that stuff into um, a table or a file. So you've got two different classes and anybody in the any place in your program can call the message class and send a message to the logger. All you have to do is in the to part of the message class, say, hey, send it to the logger and the logger has to, to be syncing these events and go, oh, I'm the logger class. So if, if the two part is for me, I take the, the message, do something with it. If it's not for me, I just ignore it. And somebody else, it may, may be going to, who knows, the accounting software. And the, and the two might be accounting, you know, so... So let's take a, a question here. Does anyone have a question about this stuff? And are we too into the weeds? With regard to the two in the weeds, I don't think so. I, I do okay. have one rather basic question. Sure. You're using the terms sync and raise. Would you take a minute to define those, explain what those mean in this context? Uh, we took okay, so granted that everybody knows, but, you know. Yeah, and yes. So events are raised. That's one term. Sourced is another term. I came from electronics and uh, transistors, source current and sync current. And that may be where the, so the terms came from. I don't know. But events are raised. And typically, somebody raises an event and somebody syncs the event. I don't know if there's another term for the sync part of it. What, what, but, does, it, what does it mean to say it, it syncs the event? What, what is well, okay, so, so you're familiar with a combo box click event, right? Yes. You've, you've, you've created a click event, and it's when you do that normally – the click event itself is created in the forms class. So now when you click or double click or whatever that event was, if you double click in a combo box and that there's an event sync, which is that code. Hang on a second. Let me go into here. Would that be event handler, John? Yes, event handlers. Yeah, can yes. I make a suggestion about that? It's like on sure. the property sheet, if it says event procedure, there's something behind there. 
but there might be something behind there. An event procedure got lost on the property sheet needs to be put back there. And to me, that's like sinking it when it's on the property sheet and it points to something that it can do. I know that's an analogy and I think you're mm -hmm. doing a great job explaining things, yeah, John. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's another thing you need to understand, which is we've got here, we've got uh, for the form, I think, the on open and on close, right? Those are events. If you have this exact verbiage, open parentheses, event procedure, close parentheses, if you have that in the property, that event will be raised. That doesn't discuss whether it will be sunk by anybody. All it says is that the form will raise an open event. In order for it to be sunk, you have to come in here and which which event was that? Open. Okay. So this is the event sync right here. Right? And and we all know if you double click in here on activate or on let's do on activate. If you double click in here, what does the what does access do? It puts that exact verbiage in here. And then it creates behind the scenes, it creates ent sync for you, which by the way, I wanted to point this out. If you debug compile, oh, thanks. <laughs> if you if you debug compile, access and there's nothing in that event sync. I'm gonna do it again. Hang on a sec. If there's nothing in that event sync and you do do a debug compile, it will take it back out again. It'll clean up. It says, hey, this isn't being used, so I'm going to take it right back out again. I, co I come back over here. You notice it put in this event procedure thing, right? And then when I clicked in here, I don't know if it was already there or if the clicking on it caused it to be put in here. But sure enough, there's the activate sync. So now I can put anything I want in here. And now that code will run on the form activate, right? The thing to know, though, is that if Joe Blow comes along and goes, hey, uh, I don't need that, and takes that out, well, back over here, it still exists. Oops. Very well, but hey. The, the event itself still exists. But because that event procedure text does not exist in the in this property, the event is never raised. So I've got an open and I've got a close, right? So if I open this thing, the let's put a if I open this thing. Sure enough, my open event fires, right? And I do something. I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm going to do something. Oh, okay. It opens a couple of forms. Oops. Yeah, we're going to do that. And then the close happens, right? And so forth. Well, guess what? If we... Hmm, I'm going to suggest it was in here. If we come in here and we simply swipe this and delete it, and we swipe the next one and delete it. And now we open this form. That code doesn't run anymore. The events are never raised. The close event, the open event are never raised by the form. Why? Because that exact verbiage is not in those events. So that's a problem. And so what I do in my, if I create a class, I will say, let me dot on open equals like this. 
on open. I'm going to take this out of here and I'm going to put it in here. Well, that's not going to work. Let's let's uh, put that in the open event here on close. I hate it when uh, when people try and code live in front of me. Uh, mostly because it doesn't work very well. So so this thing is going to actually put this text into the on close event for the form, right? So if the open event happens, I'm going to come back over here and do on open. Because I put this event procedure text in this property, that event will now fire. It'll now be raised. Okay, so we're going to come back over here and do a form view. And sure enough, guess what just happened? The form happened and me on close got set to event procedure because I told it to set it to event procedure. And now when we're done, if we come back over to our to our code window, <laughs> well, I was ex I was expecting this to say event procedure. But when I create a class, I set the properties that I want set to event procedure inside the class. Every class has a second. I got I got I got stuff in my way here. Might need to look at timing shortly, John. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We're running yeah, out of yeah, time. Yeah, thank uh, you, Adrian. Yes, I was sitting here thinking that alone, that discussion alone, was worth the price of admission, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm thinking, well, given time, could we impose on you to come back in a month or two? And oh, you absolutely can if you're if you're if you're willing to. <laughs> to... Yeah. I will try and be a little more organized next time. No, no, it's, no. It's, it's a that. deep it's just, subject. Yeah, sadly, I mean, yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I think we're just scratching the surface at this point, and oh. and as it is frequently happens, I start to get involved and lose track of time. So thank you, Adrian, for right. checking. Yes, that. thank you, thank but, you, Adrian. Yeah, if if we can kind of come to a a pausing point and then plan yes. for maybe November. That would be fine. Okay, perfect. Let's let's do that rather than cut you short and try to rush anything, because okay. I, like I say, this that this this discussion has been well worth. Uh, so let me let me just do a couple of little demo real quick, and then yeah. we'll just open it up for for conversation. Yes. Um, my record selector. This is one of my record selectors. Okay, and there's a class CLS Rexel. That, that wraps a combo box and does this thing. Uh, uh, moves the, the form to the record that's pointed to by the control. Okay, so that's a class wrapping a combo box to make the combo box do something that I want the combo box to do. Okay, so the next thing is, if you look at this one, um, I've got a table or a form called eye color. And if I double click in this eye color, it this class wraps a combo box and says, hey, on a double click, open a form, and I pass in the name of the form so it knows what form to open. Open this form and move record to point to, you use the primary key, of course, but the record blue, okay? So the idea, of course, is somebody spelled it wrong, you know. And so now when this thing closes, well, blue is now spelled wrong. So somebody spelled blue wrong. I want to go in there and fix it. I can go in there, B-L-U-E. And when I close the form, blue is now spelled correctly. 
moves to brown, moves to red. It moves directly to the the thing that the the record that you want that's pointed to by the combo box. In this case, it's the hair color form because I told it you. It's the same exact class that's doing this. Uh, one of them I passed in form hair color. The other I passed in form eye color and the same class. So that's an example of um, using a class to do something. I, I just found this useful. You know, my, my users at that uh, disability insurance specialist place had to enter their own data and they had to fix each other's errors and, and so forth. And so I just built this little thingy that said, hey, you know, I'll, I'll let certain people, supervisors, go in, double-click hair color, and they can go in and edit these things. And eye color, they can go in and edit these things. All of my forms, basically, if, if it had data like data entry, I had a record selector that would, that would allow it to move. The message class we already looked at. Demo email. Uh, I don't think you guys have that. I had to automate Outlook such that Outlook would receive emails. And if it was from a particular address or it had a particular subject matter, it would raise an event. And my application was listening. It had an Outlook object, a class to wrap Outlook, and it would it would sync the events. And so I would see all these emails coming in, and I'd look at the subject, and I'd go, it was for an order entry place. Um, and the subject would say order. And I'd go, oh, this is an order. I need to vector off into this part of my application and process the order, pull all the data out and put it in tables and and send stuff off and take money and all that kind of crap. So so I'm wrapping Outlook and syncing Outlook's events inside of Access, which is pretty fun, pretty powerful thing to do. And, but in order to do that, you have to you have to understand classes and you have to, because only classes can sync events. So if you don't understand classes and you don't understand how to how to do a with events and sync the classes for something inside of your program, you can't automate Outlook like this. So. All right. Oh, so I'm going to I'm going to call it a day. OK, on, on that note. Yeah, I, I think as I can say we've we've had insight or i've had insight i hope other people have, have shared that same insight as to what we were talking about and how this all works uh, yeah and i didn't and, even get around and maybe to, maybe if demo. after we've digested it for a little while if you come back and and do a deep dive into some of the code uh, there's a question in chat about uh inserting classes into a form and some other okay. some other Let me... aspects of it. So, um, okay, I, I think there's enough meat to to breed, to have another whole session if if you're willing to do that in November. I'm absolutely willing. Yeah, okay. sure. Does anybody object? <laughs> so the the document that I wrote and the demo has code that you can read the document and hopefully step through the code, the corresponding code, the demo stuff out in my demo database. So if you guys download that, read this little document, seven pages, um, and follow that and go out into the demo and look at the code. You know, the message class is pretty simple. The there, I, I think out there I've got a, a timer class it's really darn simple you know so so you can um, start understanding this if you're one of the people that did not raise your hand that you don't do this all the time this that will give you a, a good introduction i think the document itself and you can certainly comment and 
send me emails saying, hey, explain this a little more or something. So, so I can't see the, I don't know how to see the comments. Somebody had a, had a question about uh, would, yeah, inserting the, classes into yeah. forms. It, it, just if you could demonstrate how you do that, how you insert a sure. class into a form. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I thought you said you were going to wait till next time because yeah. that's starting to get kind of meaty, don't you? Yeah, think? yeah, and, yeah, and I and I'm yeah, I'm looking at the clock and thinking we probably need to kind of um, absolutely. Do that. I was wondering, do you have an email address we can contact you at? You can jwcolby at gmail dot com. Yeah, isn't that a bit complicated, and, John? I'm sorry. Isn't that a bit of a complicated address? Yes, J for John, W for Weston, <laughs> Colby, and you're good to go. <laughs> gmail.com. Okay, great. in fact, I was one of the first people to get a Gmail. Well, you I mean, try and get JW Colby now, and there's probably 47 billion of them, and they all have to have a 001002 at the end. But, you oh, know, yeah. I. <laughs> I I was probably the one thousand person to get a Gmail address, so I picked JW Colby. And uh... I'd also like to point out for those of you who haven't been seeing the video, because John John's been on video all the way through, that as he's been going through this um, session, he's obviously been drinking heavily because he's slipped further and further down. <laughs> <laughs> we, see, we see the fuzzy background, like he said, it is alcohol. Oh. Oh my goodness! Your oh, camera, yeah. your, your camera is... <laughs> you know what's happening? I sit in my I sit in my chair, my recliner, yeah. and and Just I pull my I've got a table that holds my laptop, and I pull it up on my rather large tummy, <laughs> <laughs> and then and that of course means that I'm slipping further. And further. You've got oh, plenty of support for your laptop. I, sh yeah. I sure yeah. wish you'd told me that a little earlier because I don't even drink. <laughs> I'm probably the only one that says I've got two screens and I've got you on one screen and, the, and what you're showing on the other. So. Okay. Ah. So, all right. So let's do a little bit of a wrap up and then we'll stop the recording. And if there's any other discussion, you're free to do that. Uh, next sure. month, our presentation will be by Pat Hartman. She's going to talk about using. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to have to pull up and read because uh, I will do it injustice if I don't. Oh, and I've already closed it. Um, the The question that was raised: How do you find records to a form in a grid that looks like an Excel workbook a worksheet with rows and columns? And she has a demo of her method for attacking that problem, which she's going to share with us next month. It's and bound. Who is this? Pat Hartman. She's in oh. uh, Connecticut. Yeah. Anyway, okay. that that presentation will be next month, and and John has committed to come back in November as a follow up, and I'll juggle some other presentations around a little bit and make room for that. Uh, and with that, we'll kind of wrap up the formal part. I'll stop the recording. And if there's any discussion, feel free to do that.